Hello everyone! In previous videos, I showed you three simple constructions made from parts of an old TV. You can find the link to the video in the description. Back then, I mentioned that there would be several videos on this topic, and today will be another one. We will look at just one construction, but it deserves attention due to its simplicity, and might be relevant for many. This is a simple network pulse power supply with output voltage stabilization, and it is built with just two transistors. It provides power of about 40 to 50 watts. The output voltage is adjustable, ranging from about 7 to 15 volts. However, by recalculating some components, different adjustment limits can be achieved. It cannot be said that the presented circuit is a novelty. I based it on the standby power supply of a classic ATX computer power supply unit. Only the power was increased by an order of magnitude, and in addition, old parts from Soviet televisions were used. I tried not to use foreign components, but I still had to. For example, the optocoupler PC817 and the highly stable reference source TL431. Although theoretically, the latter could be replaced with a regular Zener diode. The input choke, diodes of the input rectifier, and electrolytic capacitors are also imported. But they can also be found in Soviet TVs. Suggests that in my case, they were used in other projects. And regarding the capacitors, I strongly recommend using imported ones. Soviet ones explode terribly, many are dried out, and their sizes are bulky. By the way, initially, I was developing not just an adjustable power supply, but a full-fledged charger with current and voltage stabilization. And it even worked quite well. Hence, the messy wiring on the board. In the end, I had to redesign the control unit. I decided not to make the charger, as I'm preparing a separate video on this topic with a more advanced design. But let's return to our power supply. The printed circuit board of our power supply is bulky for two reasons. Initially, there were more components here, which were eventually removed, and the radio components themselves are large. Of course, I redesigned the board. For those who want to replicate it, there's an archive in the description where you'll find the printed circuit board in lay format for home LUT technology, as well as Gerber's for ordering nice boards from a factory. Almost all the necessary components can be found on the MP3 3 power module and on the line scan board. The source circuit is a typical self-oscillating converter. No PWM controllers. This is good in terms of simplicity, but overall, PWM definitely rules. At the very beginning, you need to pull out the KT838 transistor, which is a fairly good high-voltage NPN transistor. Or the KT846 transistor. It is also suitable for our purposes. The transistor needs to have its original heatsink. Next, we do older the KB226 diodes and pay attention to the index, or more precisely, the color coding. Those rated for 400 to 600 volts will be used as the input rectifier. Those rated for 800 volts can be used in the lamp circuit, which suppresses the transformer's reverse spike. The low voltage diodes from this series will be used as the output rectifier. As I mentioned, the circuit is self-oscillating. The converter contains two transistors. The main working component is the upper switch, while the lower one controls it. There is a feedback system for voltage or stabilization. The stabilization voltage is set by resistors in the reference source circuitry. One of these resistors is variable. By adjusting it, the output voltage will change smoothly. The specified resistor sets the stabilization current of the reference source. Voltage stabilization works in a simple way. The TL431 chip is a high-precision, highly stable reference source at 2.5 volts. Simply put, it's a Zener diode that activates at 2.5 volts. It monitors the output voltage using a resistive divider. When the output voltage of the power supply changes, the voltage at the output of the divider also changes, which is the control output of the reference source. If the voltage is above this threshold, the chip will activate the power through the chip and the limiting resistor will go to the optocoupler's LED. It will light up, activate, and the optocoupler's transistor will apply a driving voltage to the low-power transistor in the inverter circuit. In turn, it will open, reducing the signal at the base of the power transistor, and the latter will begin to close. As a result, the energy supplied to the power transformer, similar to a choke, will decrease. In this case, the output voltage of the power supply will decrease until the voltage at the output of the divider is below the limit. By the way, it's important to note that for proper stabilization operation, 
The source needs to be lightly loaded. Without a load, the output voltage might fluctuate a little. This circuit is also equipped with protection. For this, there is a current sensor connected to the emitter circuit of the power transistor. In cases of excessively high loads or other issues that lead to an extreme increase in current, the voltage drop across this sensor increases. At a certain point, when this voltage reaches the threshold of the lower transistor, it will open, thereby dampening the positive potential at the base of the power switch, causing it to start closing. Let's move on. This resistor acts as a current limiter for charging the input electrolytic capacitor. It is advisable to replace it with a low resistance NTC thermistor, which can be taken from a non working computer power supply or an imported television. Power transformer, or to be more precise, it's a multi winding choke, as in this circuit it functions specifically as a choke. The TPI 4 3 transformer is used as the basis. It is specifically designed to work in such circuits and has a non magnetic gap between the core halves, which is necessary in our case. However, it is naturally necessary to rewind the transformer for our needs. Let's talk about winding the transformer. To disassemble it, I boiled the core in hot water, but that didn't help. The glue is quite strong, so I had to carefully heat the core with a hairdryer, but it's best not to do it this way. Unfortunately, I slightly broke the core, but it's not a big deal. It can be glued with super glue, and it will hardly affect the performance. This has been tested multiple times. After that, all the factory windings are removed from the frame and new ones need to be wound in their place. First, the primary or collector winding is wound. It consists of 36 turns with a triple wire of 0.33 mm. The winding is not done all at once. First, we wind half of this winding on the bare frame, which is 18 turns. The winding leaves can be insulated with heat shrink tubing. Next, we insulate the winding itself. You can use the original insulation, but I prefer Captain Heat Resistant Tape. We apply three to four layers of insulation. After that, we wind the secondary or power winding completely. In our case, this winding is wound with a 0.7 mm wire in four strands. The number of turns is four. On top of this winding, we also apply three to four layers of insulation and wind the second half of the primary winding, which also consists of 18 turns and is wound with a triple 0.3 mm wire. Here I pay attention to the phasing of the windings. The start of the winding for all windings on the diagram is indicated by dots, and it's very important not to mix them up. After winding the second half of the primary winding, the end of this winding is soldered to the start of the first half. The resulting tap will not be used in the circuit, and it can be shortened so it doesn't dangle. On top of the second half of the primary winding, we again place insulation and wind a couple of turns with a 0.3 mm wire. This is our feedback winding. And on top of all this, we again place insulation, and you can even use the original insulating material for aesthetics. Then we secure the halves of the core with the same captain tape. And after a complete check for reliability, you can even glue the halves together with super glue. The copper shield can also be put back in place. Next, we solder the transformer onto the board, thoroughly check everything, and start the power supply, but make sure to do it through an input safety lamp of 220 volts, at 40 to 60 watts. In my case, nothing started on the first try. In the end, after the initial diagnostics, I didn't find any problems. Everything turned out to be simpler. During the winding, I made a mistake with the coils and mixed up the phasing of this tiny coil. I swapped the leads by cutting the traces on the board and installing jumpers because I was too lazy to de-older the transformer and do it properly, and everything worked. During operation, without a load, the power supply might whistle, but not much. This is generally normal. The original MP33 unit also whistles, and overall this phenomenon for similar power supplies, even for low power ones, is not uncommon. Testing. Let's check the adjustment limits of the output, voltage, minimum, and maximum. Checking the stabilization of the output voltage. The first multimeter shows the input or mains. Voltage, the second one shows the output. With changes in the mains voltage within a certain range, the output voltage is quite stable. How's the ripple? You might ask. Let's take a look. Load is 3 amps. Output voltage is 12 volts. Tower up. The output is around 35 watts. The ripple value peak to peak, I think you can see it clearly. 
Is it a lock or a little? Certainly not great, but look at the circuit itself. It's a model of simplicity and expecting. Ultra-low ripple from such circuits is unnecessary. Such a unit is quite suitable for powering most non-demanding loads. Where to apply it is up to you to decide. I have drawn up to 50 watts from this unit. In theory, you could go higher, but this topology is not relevant for powerful sources. In conclusion, the circuit has the right to exist, but I prepared this video material mainly for informational purposes. In a real situation, if you decide to go through the trouble, it's better to assemble a power supply circuit based on specialized PWM controllers, for example, from the UC38 family. This thing is recommended to be done only if you have a purely sporting interest or in case of extreme necessity. And that's all from me. Share this video with your friends on social media if you liked it. Follow my Instagram, where I periodically post photos of new projects. Well, that's about it. You'll find all the useful links in the description of this video. And with that, I say goodbye. As always, this was Kazianov K. With you, until next time. Bye.